go ahead and be turning to the third chapter of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. That will be the basis of our study for the next few moments here uh, this morning. Before we get into chapter 3, we want to quickly review the outline of the book, and then we'll get into uh, chapter 3. The book of Philippians, as we've said, is about commitment in Christ. The key verse is chapter 1 and in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We've been showing this outline by Wearsby as one of the uh, as an alternate to the one we're following. Uh, we have the single mind in chapter 1, the submissive mind in chapter 2, the spiritual mind in chapter 3, and the secure mind in chapter 4. Now the outline we're following is this one. Chapter 1 is about Christ my life. 2, Christ my example. 3, Christ my hope. 4, Christ my strength and sufficiency. We're ready for chapter 3. Uh, real quick, chapter 4 is already out and on the back table under the picture board if you want to pick up chapter 4 uh, for when we get there. And so it's on the picture board uh, next to the outlines for 2 and 3. Uh, if you haven't got 2 or 3 yet, they're also still uh, on the back table. If you think you got 2 but not 3, flip the page over. Chapter 3 is on the other side. Uh, those two are uh, together. Chapter 3, Christ my hope. This chapter divides down into three uh, major sections. Uh, the first of those spans 1 to 11, and it is about uh, the fact that uh, our hope is not in the flesh. And so uh, Paul, beginning at 1 and going through verse 2, talks about being aware of, of, of Judaizers who hope in the flesh. In verse 1 he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for to me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. And so he's, he's, he's warning them here of uh, the Judaizing uh, teachers. If you look at other translations, it'll translate it a little bit different. The ESV says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the things, same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And so uh, it, it, it says they're not just the mutilation, but it's the mutilation of the flesh. And, and what Paul's talking about here in these first couple of verses, it seems is he's dealing with those that are Judaizing teachers. And so his reference to mutilating the flesh is more their focus is on circumcision and the things of the flesh. That's where they're putting their hope. You remember back in Galatians, when we studied the book of Galatians, Paul was dealing with a number of Judaizing teachers among the churches of Galatia. And as he deals with them, he talks about those who were of the promise, and he, he compares us to Isaac, the son of promise, and Ishmael, a son of flesh. And he compares the Judaizers to the flesh. And so, uh, beware of these that are uh, trying to teach these things and push these things, who are putting their stock not in spiritual things, but, their, but in things of the flesh. Now in verse 3 beginning, we've got a, uh, a shift to talk about Paul's view of the flesh. So 1 and 2, beware of the Judaizers who are hoping in the flesh. Now the point of the first 11 verses is our hope is not to be in the flesh. So beginning at verse 3 is Paul's view of the flesh. In 3 to 6, he talks about how he could have confidence in it. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And so in verse 3 he says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Now in verse 3 I don't think he's talking about those that are physically of the circumcision. He's using it as it's sometimes used to talk about those that are spiritual in nature. And the reason I think that is he says, who worship God in the Spirit. 
Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now those who, as he said, in the, as the ESV renders it, mutilate the flesh, those that are binding circumcision, those are ones whose confidence is in the flesh. So in verse 3, I think the point is, we are the true circumcision, not necessarily in the flesh, but though spiritually, we are the circumcision when we worship God in spirit, when we rejoice in Christ and we have no confidence in the flesh. Real quick, if you're still highlighting through, uh, as we've been talking about throughout these chapters, when we come to our, uh, our, our key words here, uh, joy and uh, rejoicing, we talked about as they uh, occur time and time again, they occur in verse 1 and verse 3 of this chapter. Finally, my brethren, rejoice. For we are the circum- and in verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3 is the one that has the least occurrences. It only has two. Those are the only two occurrences of all those uh, key words, joy and rejoice, in this chapter. But if you want to go ahead and note that, verse 1 and verse 3 are our two occurrences here in chapter 3. Verse 4 now. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. You know what Paul's talking about here is he comes into chapter 3. He begins by saying, beware of the Judaizers who's putting their stock and putting their hope in the flesh. Now in verse 3, we have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, Paul says, I could have confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And what Paul's trying to point out here is not about, it's not like Paul could say, well, don't put your confidence in the flesh. And say, oh, listen. The reason you don't put confidence in the flesh is you just have no reason to put your confidence in the flesh. You're just not in the same kind of situation that these others are that they could put confidence in the flesh. What Paul says is, if that's where you want to put your confidence, I could do more so. Look at verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day. Again, what's the main issue of the Judaizers? They're trying to bind circumcision. Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. Right? He's a Pharisee. Now you think through your, your religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, you've got the scribes, you've got the lawyers. He's part of those religious leaders among the Jews. Concerning zeal. We say, okay, well, Paul, maybe you're a Pharisee, but maybe you just weren't very zealous for for that the old law, and that's why you don't put stock in it. No, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. So you can't look at Paul and say, "Well, now, Paul, you know, you don't, you don't have reason to put confidence in the flesh because you just don't have the same kind of uh, resume, if you will, that the rest of us do." And Paul says, "No, I was circumcised the eighth day. I was, you know, I'm an Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was a." One of the religious leaders of the people. Well, Paul, maybe you just weren't very zealous. No, concerning zeal, I went as far as persecuting the church. And, you know, that's what I thought was right, and that's as far as I went. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Not that he was sinless. He would point that out in Romans chapter 7. But rather, he had done what was required of him in the law so that he could be uh, pleasing uh, to God. And so he says, listen, when all the, you look at all the things of the flesh, you sort of want to take your resume, if you will, in the flesh. And Paul says, I'll put mine up against anybody's. Now verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for Christ. All those things that you could say from the fleshly standpoint were a gain to Paul, and all the things Paul had. Paul says, those things, I counted those as a loss for Christ. You know. What what Paul uh, when Paul looked at the things of the flesh, this wasn't what was important. I, I, you know that that that, that I'll just kind of uh, mark off. That's a loss to me because what's most important is making sure I'm pleasing to God and serving Him. Verse eight. Yet indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You know, again, as you go back to Paul's. Uh, again, uh, for lack of a better term, his resume in the flesh, if you will. When, when you go back to that and you look at all the things that he's listed there, and, and he's a Pharisee, and, and, and he's so zealous, he's a persecutor of the church, 
and uh, you've probably heard me say this before, Paul did not already have a seat on the Sanhedrin Council. With the respect he had garnered among them, he would have been well on his way. I mean, if he here he is, uh, somebody that is, is well respected and everything, and if he's not on the Sanhedrin already, he's going to be there. And Paul says, all those things, those that count as, as lost. Those that count as, as, as rubbish, he says in verse 8. That word rubbish, uh, it, you know, it, it literally has to do with that which is a waste. It's, it's sometimes used to refer to human waste. And he's just saying all those things, they were completely useless. It was just something to be thrown out and thrown aside because none of that is as important. Look again, verse 8. The excellence of the knowledge of Christ my Lord. All those things are rubbish. Verse 8 again, very end, that I may gain Christ. So what Paul says is, you want to put your, your, your resume and the flesh up against mine, I'll put mine up with anybody's. And then you know what I'll do? I'll tear that up and I'll put it to the side because that's lost, that's rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. That's the attitude we need to have. We don't hope in the flesh. We don't put our stock in things of the flesh. It's about gaining Christ. And all those things will count as lost for the sake of gaining Christ. Yes. Even though he called account these things as loss, this doesn't take away from the fact that it was a sacrificial life. So he walked away from those things. Okay, he didn't just walk away from those because those were things that were held high as far as a Jewish perspective to go. But then he went on to serve Christ. Moses had the riches of Egypt at his disposal. What did he do? He sacrificed all of that to esteem the riches in Christ far more better. So I guess, you know, to give up something that's a loss or whatever, it's no value. It's, this doesn't mean that he did not sacrifice a lot in the circumstances. You're right. You know, it, it, I mean, again, you go back to just that lineage and everything he went through and everything he had. And if what he didn't have, he could have had. And he'd get rid of all that because what's most important is the service to God. Verse 9 now. And be found in him. So let, let's go ahead and back up. We're in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of a sentence. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any may, means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul says, all those things are a law so I can gain Christ, so I can be found in Him, not having my own righteousness based on the law and because of the good things that I have done and how I kept No, it's based off faith. It's through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. The reason he wants that righteousness is that, verse 10, he may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death so that he can attain the resurrection from the dead. He needs to know all that of Christ so he can attain the resurrection from the dead. Not just being raised from the dead. We know in John, uh, as Jesus pointed out in John, that all will be raised, but this is the resurrection and the life. Keep verse 11 in your mind. When we get to the key verse in a minute, verse 14, so again, if you have marked that down, verse 14 is the key verse. When we get there in a minute, I think verse 11 helps us in understanding what all is under consideration as well. Verse 14. So what Paul says is, all these I've counted as lost. All the things of the flesh I count as lost so that I may gain Christ, so that I may have the reward, that I may have the resurrection from the dead. Well, now beginning at verse 12, Paul talks about where his hope is. His hope is not in the flesh, but the hope is in Christ for the prize of the upward call. Look, beginning at verse 12. And verse 12 and 13. First and foremost, he's not yet attained or obtained the prize. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And then we'll finish that sentence in a minute and pick that back up. But what Paul said, let's back up to verse 11 again. What does he say in verse 11 he wants to attain? The 
resurrection from the dead. Verse 12 now, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. So I, I don't have that yet. Right? So I press on so that I can lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Verse 13, I don't count myself to have apprehended. I haven't got to the ultimate goal yet. So what do I have to do? Verse 13, forget those things which are behind. Well, there's two standpoints in which we may do that. Uh, one standpoint is sometimes people may become so bogged down in thinking about the bad things they've done in the past, they allow themselves to be frustrated instead of focusing on living right in the time that is ahead of us. The other side of that is sometimes people are so focused on the good they've done in the past, they forget they need to continue in that because it's, how the con it's not about what condition you had been in, it's the condition you're in when your life ends or when Christ returns. And so you've got to forget the things behind. Paul can't focus on all the things of the flesh and what he had done and how he was a persecutor of the church. Not that he doesn't focus on the lessons he learned from that, He's not focused on that previous condition. He's focused on what's ahead and trying to get to that five. Yes. Look at Luke 17, 10. It said, after we've done all the work of man to do, say, we are unprofitable servants. So there's one aspect that Jesus was, he did shine some light on this. After we've done, you know, that's going to be based on our accounts. It's going to be an accountability issue. After we've done all the work of man to do, you know, say, we're unprofitable servants. Another thing I think Jesus said, his earthly ministry said, that when the woman came and washed his feet and anointed him, some of the self-righteous people said, well, if this man were a prophet, he didn't know what sort of woman this was. And Jesus goes on to say, well, a man forgave two, two men a debt. One of them was a great debt, the other one was somewhat minuscule in comparison. He said, which one will love the most? And he said, I suppose the one that was forgiven a lot. So there's a sense where when we recognize the blood of Jesus and how it cleanses us from our sin and all that we will meet from a life if we don't give up like Paul says here. There's that aspect of it. But even if we have sort of caught a lot in the past or whenever we do that, we're still not to be arrogant and think it's on our own merit that we're going to get this eternal life. You're right. You know, in fact, that's what Paul brought up in the previous section about it's not my own righteousness. Now, he's talking about righteousness by the old law and then we've been the heaven perfectly keeping it. In order to be truly righteous, he talks about that in his other epistles. But it's because of that through faith. It's not that he did something to earn it. He he did what he had to do, uh, but, it, but it's all ultimately by the grace of God. Verse 14 now. Verse 14. Oh, well, let's back up to 13 again. We're still in the middle of a verse, or, or the middle of a sentence, rather. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. What's ahead? I press toward the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what's ahead. You know, throughout the scriptures, uh, it is often used, uh, and Paul in particular uses, the analogy of the Christian life as that of a race. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, he talks about running and boxing. You know, I don't run. Uh, he, he runs with the name. He's not one that's running aimlessly. He's not one that's uh, beating the air, boxing against the air. He's the one that talked about having finished the race in 2 Timothy. Um, if Paul wrote Hebrews, then he would have talked about it there. Uh, the Hebrew writer did, Paul or whoever it may be, about laying aside every weight and sin and running with endurance the race before us. This is another one of those analogies. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's the running of a race, and, you, and the finish line is ahead. And until you cross that finish line, guess what you haven't done? You haven't completed the race. But there's something out there. There's something for you to get to. You know, if you suppose that, that you were going to run a race and you got out there to run the race and you said, How far is this race? And they said, Ah, we don't know. We're, we're just, you, you, you just order, you, you run around and there's no end. And then when you collapse, you collapse. And that, you know, when you're too tired to keep going, that's the end of the race for you, I guess. And you just, you know, you think, Well, I don't want to run a race in which I don't know where there, that there's a, finish line, that there's somewhere to get, that there's a, a, a goal, there's a satisfaction of finishing. What Paul's saying is we're running a race, and there's a finish line, and we've got to run through it. We've got to get to the finish line. 
We've got to press toward the goal. And the reason is, look again, verse 12, not that I have already attained. I haven't attained the prize yet. Well, what is this prize? Well, two things I think about the prize and what the prize the upper call is. Part of that, one of those is it has to do with the resurrection from the dead in verse 11. Not that I have, uh, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Verse 4, or verse 13, not that I have apprehended. So that's why he forgets what's behind, but he reaches forth to what's ahead and he presses on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call. So it would be the resurrection from the dead, the resurrection unto life. It would be the ultimate goal of being in heaven. And that's the point he's making. We haven't got there yet. So we've got to press on toward the goal. We've got to keep going. Verse 15. Therefore let us who are mature have this mind. And if any, uh, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal the, even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. And so, you know, those that are mature, those that have an understanding, they're the ones that are going to think this way. I haven't got the prize yet, and so I've got to keep going. You know, if we feel like uh, we've we finished what we have to finish, and we finished our race uh, before we've actually finished our race, and we give up, then you, then you quit. Uh, you quit pressing on toward that goal. Uh, going back to the analogy of a runner, suppose you're watching a, a, a marathon. Or suppose you're running in a marathon, and as you're running along, you come to somebody that just came out the gates, and they were just flying through there, and you get a little over halfway through, and all of a sudden they're going to struggle with slump, you know, and they're just kind of just dragging on along, and they're barely moving. You're saying, what's going on? And, you know, well, they're not focused anymore on their goal. They're, they're just sort of focused on, I've already ran so, so far, and I've had to do so much. I had to go through so much training and all this stuff. And then, you know what they're not going to do? They're not going to finish the race. Well, when somebody, you know, one of the things you learn if, you, if you've ever done running, I haven't done running in a long time, but I remember that uh, it would have been like my senior year of high school, my dad and I started running together. One of us still runs, and it's not me. And we would go running, and I would come out fast, and I tell you, my, my mile was way faster, was a good minute to two minutes faster than his for the first mile. About halfway through mile two, he comes passing me by. He'd finish his three miles, and I'd be about two and a half in. Well, you know why? Because he had the mindset, the mature mindset, to say, you know what I need to do? I need to pace myself. It's not a sprint. I'm trying to get to some goal. And some in running the Christian race may come out to a sprint and then start to give up and frustrated with everything else. Well, what you've got to realize is there's still a race ahead. You've got to be mature in your mindset and realize I haven't finished what I've set out to finish. I haven't finished running this race yet. I've got to keep pressing on. Verse 16 now. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained. Apostle, we haven't attained. What do we not attain? The resurrection from the dead. But we have attained to a point some things from Christ, right? We have already... Uh, we already have the forgiveness of sins. We have the avenue of prayer. We have his, We now have the completed word. We've attained some things from Him. Let us walk with Him by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. There's, there's rules to this race. If you go out, we're, I think it's the end of July and the early August, the uh, Summer Olympics are coming up. And if you're watching the Summer Olympics, they've got, when they're running, they've got certain lanes they've got to stay in, and I think there were several years ago, I don't remember it, but I remember being told about it, somebody just barely got out of their lane, and because of that, they were disqualified, and they lost the gold medal. Well, the reason they're disqualified is a set of rules, and everybody has to be following the same set of rules. Well, we can in the Christian well, I've got my set of rules, and you've got your set of rules, and we're all running a race, but we're all running it by different rules. No, we've got to run, go by the same rule. We've got to be of the same mind. What mind? Go back to chapter 2. That's the mind of Christ. That mind of humility. When we're all focused on God's Word, we're focused on the Gospel, we're going to have that same mindset to run by the same rule and to have the same mind. Verse, <coughs> excuse me, verse 17 now. This is the walk of those with this hope. 
I guess if you're using the race, I guess, uh, it would be more of a run, but he uses the term walk here in 17. Well, those that have the hope, how is it they're walking in their life? Well, that's what Paul talks about in 17 through 4.1. Again, we talked about this a few times. Most chapter divisions are really good. Uh, the chapter divisions were put in by man much later. They weren't. You find an Old Testament or New Testament manuscript. There are no verses. There are no chapters. It's just, it's just the text. And I think this is an unfortunate chapter break because I think chapter four, verse one, should have been verse twenty-two of chapter three, and verse two of chapter four should have been verse one. And so. Uh, the thought here continues through the start of chapter 4 and in verse 1. Here's what he says. How do you walk? Well, you follow the example of faithful brethren. You're not following the world, but you look at the examples of others. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for us a pattern. You know what you can do is you can imitate faithful brethren. Using the analogy of the running again. Uh, it was once thought impossible, it's now been done several times, uh, but it was once thought impossible to run the four-minute mile. And so when the man was th that broke the record and became the first to ever do it, ran the four-minute mile, what he did was, since there was nobody to pace himself off of, he found the two fastest people in the world at running a half a mile. Can't find anybody to run a full mile in four minutes, but he found the two fastest people in the world at running a half a mile. And what he did was he followed and imitated and kept up with them. One of them for the first half a mile, the other one for the second half. He found somebody to use as an example and follow that to help him in running. Well, the Hebrew writer would even point that out in Hebrews that there's we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. You know what they've done? They've already set an example of those who have already run and finished the race. And so... How do, how do we need to be doing in this walk for those that have this mindset, those that have their hope focused on spiritual things instead of uh, 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 physical things? Well, we need to follow the example of faithful brethren. Now, 18 and 19, here's how you don't walk. If you want to be those that have this hope, the hope in Christ, the hope of the prize they will call, you don't walk as enemies of the cross. For many walk of whom I have told you often and te now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Here are those who are focused on earthly things. Here are those who are focused on physical things. They walk as enemies of the cross. They're serving not God, but their own belly or their own appetite, some translations would say. Yes, absolutely. Real quick, 20 through 4-1. Uh, four, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we all eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Therefore, my beloved and long-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. How do we maintain the walk? Right? We, we know what we need to do. We need to look at examples of faithful brethren to keep in our walk. We don't need to walk as enemies of the cross, but how do I make sure I'm maintaining that proper walk and that proper mindset? Well, number one, remember where your citizenship is. So, you know, our citizenship is in heaven. I mentioned this before. Um, the people at, at Philippi would have appreciated this statement even more. Uh, real quick, let me read this here. This is talking about chapter 1, verse 27 in the study, ESV study Bible. They made this note. But it, if you look at this verse, it references you back there. The phrase, be worthy of the gospel, translates the Greek, uh, some Greek word. As the ESV footnote indicates, the Greek can also be translated as only behave as citizens worthy of the gospel. Going back to chapter 1. A phrasing that nicely captures Paul's play on words here and in 320, our citizenship is in heaven. Philippi prided itself on being a Roman colony, offering the honor and privileges of Roman citizenship. Paul reminded the congregation they should look to Christ, not Caesar, Caesar for their model of behavior since their primary allegiance is to Christ and His kingdom. So here are people that live in one place, but they're technically citizens somewhere else. 
and they would appreciate and understand that more than we would. Our citizenship isn't here, it's somewhere else. And then finally, in chapter 4, verse 1, we need to stand fast. We don't just start doing what we need to. We stand fast in that and keep doing it all the days of our life. Lord willing, we'll pick up at verse 2 of chapter 4 on Wednesday evening and perhaps finish up the book of Philippians. Every tear lies.